Hey everybody, welcome to a new episode of the Crafting a Business podcast. Today's guest is the lovely Amanda from Cricket Cult. Oh, where do I start with Amanda? If you heard the previous episode with Lindsay, you will know that I am such a fan. <laughs> and we spent a lot of that episode fangirling <laughs> a little bit over Amanda. She is she's a bit of a powerhouse. She's an uh, amazingly talented crafter, photographer, videographer, all-around content creator. And I just wanted to kind of pick her brain because sometimes it, it blows my mind to think about how I got here, right? Like if you asked me five years ago when I was, you know, hell-bent on trying, the, trying to climb the corporate ladder and all of that, I would not even have thought about starting a business, right? But all these kind of little steps um, have got me here, right? So from working in government, from working in marketing, from working, um, you know, I used to run events, like all of that, all of those are tiny kind of breadcrumbs to get me here, right? And that really resonated with my conversation with Amanda because she actually started off in the performing arts, being a singer, singing opera. Um, and now she's this fully booked photographer, videographer, and um, is really, really, really talented. So I'm going to stop rambling, but here is the episode with Amanda. Hi, welcome, Amanda. Hi, how are you, Deb? I'm good. Um, I have been looking forward to this conversation for a very long time, and we've oh. been talking for a while, hey? We have, I, we um, have. It's been a bit of a weird journey, hey? Like, Because I think I messaged you that random time when was it last year, year before? And I was this naive, like <laughs> just started my business. And here's Amanda with her, however many thousands of followers. And I'm just like, Hey, <laughs> I have some stuff. Do you want some stuff? And I literally, I think that's all I said. And here we are. Right. Yeah. That's what I love. And we, and I, we've had many conversations about this um, over the last few months, but I struggle to find blanks that I like. Mm. And so when you contacted me, um, and there are so many blank suppliers out there. You know, I'm glad you did contact me, contact me because I'm not always, I don't have the time necessarily to find out who's out there, who's new. So I was really appreciative of the contact and uh, you were very funny. You couldn't believe I got back to you. And <laughs> oh I God, couldn't totally. believe that you, I couldn't believe that you even thought I was that important. Like to me, you know, I, I do what I do and I, it always surprises me that anyone even watches it at this point. Oh my God, that is so like, it's so testament to you as a person because you, like, I had been following your account for a long time and I think at this, this stage I had only got the cricket maybe a year ago when I was in this personalised gifting thing where I was making a whole lot of stuff but not really business-minded. Anyway, and then I found an opportunity to meld kind of like my marketing experience and all that stuff and, and found this blanks thing, right? And I have been following your, your account for a long time and just watching and I'm like consuming all this stuff. And then when I message you, I literally, I think I was at a family barbecue and I had to stop. I like, I got a message <laughs> from you and I said to my husband, I'm like, <gasps> and I just, <laughs> I was just like this. And he was like, what's wrong? He thought something happened. And anyway, and you had replied. So Anyway, here we are, and um, I have so many questions to ask you. And, and I'm ready. I'm ready to oh, answer them. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's get into the beginning. Like how, I know you have a photography and videography kind of background, but tell me from the start, like how did you even start with this creativeness, even if that's a word? <laughs> yeah, it is now. Uh, I've always, look, I've always been creative. Um, I sang and danced as a child. Um, for many, many years, and then was really into the singing. And I, um, and kind of, you know, around high school age, I started singing classical music and opera. And then I wanted to be an opera singer. So I left high school, I went to the conservatorium, I'm from West Australia, which is the conservatorium um, uh, in WA at Edith Cowan. And I did an opera degree, like I did a um, undergraduate degree, I did a postgraduate degree. And then I was a young artist with the West Australian Opera Company, I was singing. And then I moved to Sydney from Perth to continue singing. And I was doing like a postgraduate, another postgraduate kind of opera degree at the conservatorium. And then I had a problem with my voice and I got really, really sick and it was really cold that year or something. And uh, look, I'm a big talker. So I always had issues where my voice was never, um, it was never like rock solid. If I went out and I did a lot of talking, then I would lose it the next day. 
Um, and then so I started to come to the realisation that I either had to really change the way I spoke and the way I lived my life in order to fulfil this dream because my voice just it, ne it needed more care than I think my personality would allow it. Um, so I either needed to make that decision or I needed to change careers. So I um, changed careers. I was like, I don't think I can not be this person. I can't be exuberant and loud and boy, you know, I want to have a good time. I don't want to spend my whole life living as a nun um, and, you know, not doing things and not talking and being calm. And it's just not me. Um, anyone that knows me knows I'm not particularly calm. So I, um, so I quit that and I decided, well, I'm not a teacher. I'm not patient enough to teach music. Um, you know, I just, it's just not who I am. So my parents grew up, uh, grew up with my Italian parents that ran a number of businesses. My dad's a hairdresser. He owned restaurants. Food was kind of a big part of my life growing up. Um, so I went into arts management. So I did sponsorship for the Australian Chamber Orchestra and Opera Australia for a number of years. So I was still surrounded by music and in a creative environment, but doing the business side of things, which actually has held me in the best stead it can for running my own business now because I learned so much about that and you had no business acumen um, until I did that I was just a singer so um so I did that but then even though I was surrounded by music and art and creativity the fact that I wasn't creating art or being creative myself after a number of years started to become a bit of a problem for me I just I was happy for people that I saw on stage singing and I didn't want to do that anymore so it wasn't a, any regret for the actual art form, um, it was regret for not being creative. So, uh, so I, while I was at Opera Australia, I was running the sponsorship team for a number of years. I picked up a camera, uh, you know, with that food background. I just started making and shooting food, and I started a small blog, um, food blog, purely just to kind of uh, build that skill. I'd always been interested in photography, um, so I, I basically just. I think with anything creative, and I know you'll understand this, with anything creative, the more you do, the better you get. And so rather than talking about creating or, or thinking about creating, all you have to do is make something. And the first thing will be, will not be great, probably. Maybe it will. Who knows? Maybe you're a savant. But it probably won't be great. But the more and more that you do it, the better you get. So I just started shooting things, photographing, cooking. I was always a, a pretty decent cook, thanks to my mum in that Italian heritage background and my dad owning restaurants. So our food was, you know, it made sense for it to be food. And then I was, while I was at Opera Australia for the last few years, I started having clients that would come and work with me. And one of those clients is Queen Fine Foods, who you'll see in the supermarket aisles. You know, they've got vanilla bean pastes and food colourings and things like that. So they came to me through um, the blog web designer actually said oh we needed someone to shoot food for queen did you know someone so that's how I got connected that was my first client and that was in 2013 2012 2013 and um I'm still with that client and I still do monthly work with them and it's been years and years and it's um it was wonderful so but so for many years I kind of had to balance the two where I started doing work for clients it all happened organically none of it I've never actually even now to this day I've never prospected for work I've been really lucky it's all come my way um, through word of mouth and I think it's one of those things with um, you know your your creative portfolio speaks for itself often people talk about you or do you know someone that can do this and I'll go yeah I'm Amanda shoots food so it was small jobs um, and you know I look back at those photos and god the photos were terrible in my mind and the styling was terrible and I often go back just to see how far I've come um, but for a number of years I did that and then my husband and I were about to get married and he said to me you know I really think you could probably make more money longer term if you left Opera Australia and you've got enough clients now and you just, you know, started shooting. And I was doing it all from home. So I would kick in, cook in the kitchen and I would shoot on the dining room table and then pack it all away. Um, the thing that comes with the type of photography I do is that I have an insane amount of things. I have plates and cutlery and glassware and you know dishes and in terms of just just to style a shot let alone to make those things so I was doing all of that from home for a number of years I'd taken over a spare room I had kind of done all of that as as we all do when we start our businesses but mine just exploded 
Um, I remember the first week though, I rang my mom and I said, I've made a big mistake. I shouldn't have done it. You know, I've got nothing on the horizon. I fancy it. What a silly thing to have done. And, uh, and we all have those doubts. We all think, you know, we're not, I'm not good enough uh, to do this. Why did I do this? Luckily, you know, when you've got a partner who, um, you know, financially can support the household, it's a, it's a much easier leap to take. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't have taken the leap, but I probably would have waited a little bit longer to do it. So then I was shooting food. So I was, I was at home, I got busy, things just started coming. You know, every time I thought, oh, gosh, I've got a bit of a break there. Maybe I'll, you know, do something else at that point. And a week, a week before that happened, someone will go, oh, could you shoot this for me? And so all of that kind of stuff started happening. And then I was, I was basically like food photography, that was it. At the time, reels and video content wasn't, wasn't really that prevalent and really the only way that you would create um, video content was by paying videographers and having teams and doing things like that. The need for reels content, I mean, Instagram didn't even have reels back when, you know, back when I was shooting food. Um, so everything was stills, which also made it easier to do in a home setup because I just needed to work in a small space. Whereas when you're making a dish and making reels and things like that, you actually need space um, and a nice looking area, you know, you can't kind of budget like I think you can in small spaces. So uh, I did that for a number of years and then um, COVID hit and I said to my husband, all right, this is it. I'm probably going to be done for a while. You know, I, I'm sure I won't get work. And he was like, no problems. Let's just focus on Sierra. We'd had our little one by then. She features quite a lot um, in my craft account. Um, and he said, that's fine. You know, we'll just you stay home, do what you need to do. I'll support us. And, you know, if you get jobs, great. And if you don't. And so he then moved in home and I had the spare room just covered in props. So he then had to work from home in a room just surrounded by stuff. And then um, I think a year into COVID, Scott bought me a cricket machine for Christmas because food had become my job. And it had fulfilled that creative need for so long and then that became my only job and then I was like oh now all I do is food I need a bit of an outlet so um a friend of mine had bought a cricket machine um so she could make things for her little one I was like oh this is very cool Scott has a design background so my husband works in I should mention my husband's a creative director in advertising and he works um and he's also got um a design degree graphic design background so you know, it's good because we're both creative and I think that that certainly helps him understand what I do and what I need and all the rest of it. So he bought the cricket machine for me. And then, I don't know, not even that long in, Cricket ANZ contacted me and said, uh, could, you do some, could you do some projects with us that are food related? So I was still doing the food blog at the time, which I don't really run anymore, but um, it's still there, but I don't have capacity. So they had partnered with me effectively to do three or four posts using the cricket, but featuring food, which was actually a good, um, a good thing because, uh, you know, not a lot of people think to use the cricket in that way. So I did things like I made a couple of really um, incredible cake toppers to go on cakes. I made stencils to use to frost a cake with acetate using the cricket um, and you know, a bunch of different things like that. I think it had come about because I had, Sierra had her second birthday party and I had a bee party and I basically used the cricket and I just made everything. Um, and I think Beck had seen, oh, sorry, the cricket contact had seen that and um, and so got in touch and said, oh, this, you know, there's something interesting here. So then I started creating content for them and then um, that just kind of kept going. So um I then started to accumulate, so not just stuff for the food photography, but a lot of stuff for craft. Because as you know, you want to make something, you want to sit here and make something. Well, you need 50,000 things at your disposal to make something. Um, and we all joke about it. You know, there are all those great memes about, you know, I'm just going to go to the craft shop and I'll be back in five hours. You know, it's that kind of vibe. But it's like when you're sitting at home and you're going to make something, you kind of need one of everything. You know, you need glue, you need brads, you need uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, 15,000 different colours of paper just to get the right thing. So because I started to accumulate all of that stuff and I got busier shooting now craft with Cricket ANZ and food, um, my husband and I had a bit of a chat and he said, you know, 
I don't think we can keep having this all this stuff in the house because it was just exploding. This. I resonate but also, with this so much. <laughs> but also what, what happened during COVID is all those food businesses I worked for, because I did, I, so I don't work for restaurants. I should say I'm a, um, I, so develop recipes, test recipes, cook them, style them and shoot them for clients and give them the content. So they've then got um, like a recipe and a shot. They know it's tested, it's styled, they can put it up on their websites. But I work direct with food brands like um, Harris Farm Markets. I work for them and do some social content for them. Queen Fine Foods, Capilano Honey, Carem Pastry. So these are all producers of food products. And basically what happened during COVID is that they all thought they were kind of going to have a downturn, but then everyone was at home and everyone was cooking and their businesses exploded. It was the one industry, one of, other than the medical industry, but it was one of the, the, the main industries that just made a fortune. So the restaurants had real trouble, but the individual food producers didn't. And so I then had this weird situation where deep in the depths of COVID, I'm hunting for a commercial studio space um, to, to rent because I am so busy um, that I can't, I can't run it out of the home anymore. So that was a really um, strange time. Also, I'm very lucky because the studio I found is, with, is um, within five minutes from my home. And I was in one of those areas where I wasn't allowed to leave unless it was in, sorry, five minutes or five kilometres. So perfect. I was very, lu- I was very perfect. lucky. I work for myself. I'm here by myself. I've now got a great space that has a small commercial kitchen, um, a shooting area with a big table. All my props are on these huge, you know, Bunnings shelving units um, and all my craft is in a big kind of area I've created. And, uh, yeah, and it was just one of those situations where, once again, it all happened organically um, and none of it was was planned. So at no point have I, interesting, at no point have I had any grand plans about this is where I want to be and this is where how I want to get there. I've just always let the creativity speak for itself and then followed the journey as it's taken me there. But we do now have a joke that I can't take up any more hobbies because I just seem to monetize them constantly. <laughs> I think that's, so that's your talent, your superpower. Yeah, that, in a roundabout, yeah. long-winded roundabout, yeah. way, that's how I got here and it's all come from, you know, an area of creativity and then constantly following the river and the stream and the turns that it takes and just being open to all of those changes and what it's comes. Beautiful, it's a beautiful story about, uh, and we and I um, should have mentioned this earlier, but Lindsay from Lindsay Makes, I had a conversation with her. Yes, and, I know, because <clears> we're great <throat> friends. We're great and I, friends. <laughs> and we were talking about how all of these kind of steps happened like and this is a your story is a beautiful story about that because it's kind of like from your early days working in the arts industry singing and and that kind of looks like it doesn't really relate to all of the steps that have brought you here right but it's an amazing story of uh like little footsteps oh there's one touch point there's another touch point everything's kind of brought you here right and there's a skill set you know I'm drafting Mm. proposals and selling opera which is a hard sell for a lot of businesses, I'm selling opera to clients, you know, to possible sponsors. It's not core business. So within the company, it's not like we're making the, you know, we're just trying to bring the money in. And that was, I think, that Opera Australia and arts management experience has 100% made my business what it is today. I, even though I'm very, very creative, I now have a a massive business skill that's come from that particular job Um, that I bring into everyday life. So whenever a client contacts me and says, oh, we've got this project, we need some food photography or whatever it is, um, you know, could you do it for us? Like, okay, well, give me the scope of work. So I'll get a sense of what it is. And then I'll put a proposal together, just like I used to do at Opera Australia. And it will, you know, outline every step, what I understand our relationship is, what you need from me, um, how much time that's going to take, what I'm going to give you, what I'm going to give you complimentary. So things like, because I have my own, prop store I include that as part of the offering and I I've just learned to sell my business purely because I did arts management and if you had told me that would have happened I just would never have I wouldn't have picked that journey so I wouldn't have taken that step unless so that's really interesting because the business has 
the business acumen needed to come in order for me to do this creative exploit effectively. Yeah, and I feel like um, a lot of people, they're listening to this podcast and they're thinking about starting their own cricket businesses, whatever it may look like, you know. And yes, for sure, there is a way, you know, there's obviously that that way of creating the personalised gifts and, you know, going down the, I guess, traditional route of going to a market or selling it online or selling the one-off items, you know. But the reason why I wanted to talk to you was because you've kind of taken it in a different lens, right? So you've now merged all of your photography experience, your arts experience, sales experience, business acumen, all of that to kind of make this this thing that is uniquely you, right? And I love what you said about um, there is something raw about it and, and, and being really transparent about following that creativity because you never know where that's going to take you. But also you got to love it. I hate oh, making totally. the same thing over and over and over again. It kills me. I get so bored. My one thing when I had the, got the cricket was I just want to make everything once. So I want to use every blade. I want to, you know, make cards. I want to, but I just want to do everything I can do at least once. Um, and so that then sends you on a creative journey where it's not pigeonholing you into, I'm just going to make t-shirts and sell them. I'm just going to, it's like, for me, the reason this is the way I do it is because I, I, I just, I just get bored. And so what I do means that every single day I'm making something different. So two days a week, I work for Cricket ANZ, um, developing projects and helping make, um, make things and design things and shoot things, some things for retailers, some things for their own channels, um, and then we'll might use those things um, for events they might host later in the year and things like that. So I do that a couple of days a week. They're short days because my little one's at daycare. Uh, oh, sorry, at school. Um, so I do that. And then I for three days a week, I work on food. And sometimes I'm doing savoury things. Sometimes I'm baking. Sometimes. So for me, it fulfills. This absolutely fulfills my um, desire to not be bored because I just, you know, I've got a lot of energy. That's one thing as well. You know, like I work till at least three nights a week, 10, 30, 11, 12 o'clock editing photos. But, but I love it. And I think that's why I do it. So I have mm. found the thing that I enjoy about crafting and about food photography. And I, and that's what I hone in on. Um, there are a lot of people making a lot of things. And so for me, um, for me, I just, I just needed to find a different route. I had to get out of the noise, you know, but I, I was never, I was never going to make things to sell. That's not, you know, that wasn't kind of, um, it didn't interest me personally. And I think that you have to find what interests you personally. Totally. And so if you love T-shirts, yeah, if you love T-shirts, yeah. if you love iron-on, then amazing. Design things, follow that path, go down the screen printing route, you know, do, do, do that, focus on that. But I think if you try to be all things to all people, you can't ever do one thing perfectly. You know, for me, even though I like to make a lot of things, I am a content creator and I now have a food business that brings in. So one thing I did do was expand my business as a food creator. And I now have a copywriter that works with me and offers food copywriting skills. We've got a web developer that can work with brands and create links and shops and things like that. Social media managers for those food brands um, where we'll manage their content and I'll work with them on the content they need for that. And then, so so it's it's you know just finding the niche which for me is content creation and that's what I enjoyed the most more than anything yeah it's really interesting because like I th I think too many people aren't true to themselves in terms of yeah. what they want to do and they they think that they okay I need to go out and make I don't know I need to get really good at making coffee cups or whatever it is and I need to kind of rinse and repeat and do that 50 times to make money no, you don't. You need to find what you're good at. If you love making coffee cups and doing that same design 50 times, go nuts. Yeah, right? amazing. But Do if it. you don't, call it out. Yeah. Call that out and figure out what your path is. I mean, I'm the perfect example, right? Like when I first started making personalized gifts, I loved the making, but I didn't, I, it was too hard. Like too hard as in I had a young baby, I had family commitments, I had, you know, time. all of this. It takes so much time. I, yeah, I didn't have the time and I didn't have two hands to make stuff, right? So I realized my forte was in that community building, but also retailing, figuring out what, what our customers want, figuring out and listening to our customers and how do I work with suppliers to bring that stuff in to bridge that gap in the market? Because clearly there was, you know, it, it, it 
wasn't available, right? So there's real merit in niching, yes, niching down, but also being true to what you like doing and what you don't. Because if you and just following the path and following and the following path, the sometimes path, you might yeah. not know. And that's okay too. You might not know. So you do have to go through a journey to figure it out. And, um, and but you just have to be open to it and you have to be flexible. You and I have a lot of conversations where I say, I'm trying to find this thing and I can't, you know, can you, you know, do you think that would sell? Because I'm constantly, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't really, there's not really many blank suppliers I go to now um, because I know that I can come to you and you'll have things that are interesting or different or we can have a conversation about it. And if you think that it's something that will, you know, you could bring in and try, um, then then great, we'll do that. And I think that's that's where your flexibility and your ability to pivot because the challenge is when I think you're making the same thing every day is you think that you're always going to be selling this amount of the same thing every day, but you're not. The only way I think that you can um, that you can grow if you want to grow or just you know have enough work um, is if you're prepared to 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 change if you need to change. Um, and what's the next thing? As a lot of people always, especially in the in all the kind of craft chats and forums and different groups that there are, there's a lot of people that sell things that say, "Oh, so and so is just copying me," and I'm really frustrated. And yes, and unfortunately, that happens everywhere. And we know Kmart and Target copy things, and they make, and we know we can't compete with them. And we know, but if you are truly creative, you should have an endless supply of ideas. Or if you're not, there are ways. You there are lots of books to read about thinking creatively, and if it's not natural, it can be a learned skill. And so, what I think is more important than anything is not trying to worry about what other people are doing because if you're doing something really well they'll copy you regardless it's the industry so what you then have to go is okay what's the next thing and that's what I think totally. Deb you do really well is oh, the ability to go okay here's the gap in the market okay let's go with that all right what's the next okay yep well someone else is doing that now okay great so my, our market shares change so but that's how you've grown so quickly too I think um it and totally is and yeah and, and I it, like if you have the expectation that someone is going to copy you and realize that it is a good thing that someone is copying you it will fuel you to grow quicker I think and yes yeah I get annoyed I mean one time I had someone screenshot my photo and post it to a local um group and say does anyone make this locally literally it was my cup with my font my thing and I was I was pissed of course you know yeah and, and you were I, local when, I know. And I'm like, hello, I'm local. Literally, you clicked on my website and anyway, whatever. It's still, there's still a little bit of a sting, right? But <laughs> what I'm saying is that that was another 20, turning point for me because I realized, okay, maybe I'm not meant to be in this personalized gifts game, right? Maybe I'm meant to be, okay, change the cup, change yep. the color, change the vinyl. What if this, cup, you know, obviously this cup shape, you know, is too common. What's next? That's yep. what led me to bring in can glasses, which is obviously yep. my seller. Um, you know, and developing new products every time. Literally the amount of uh, messages that I have, my suppliers think I'm a bit crazy because I'm like, I want to change this. No, I don't like that. I want to change. Yeah. And it costs a lot of money to bring that stuff in, right? So there's something, there is a niche in being able to pivot, but also being able to do things on the fly and yes. listen to your creativity. I yes. Think. Yeah, Absolutely. I think it's really important. And I think that, um, you know, you see, you see so much on, on, on chats and things, people talking about having to undercut their rates. And that's one thing I, I can do. I know how to price yeah. myself. And that is the yeah. most important thing that people need to realise. And as a community, you know, luckily what I do is quite niche. It's quite specialised. And there aren't a lot of people that have the skill set that I have or, and, and the skills that I have has come to me from years of doing this work. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's learned skill um, that people can learn. They can do what I do. It'll take them a bit of time. But in terms of like being able to, I don't know, as, a, as, as craft creators or people that create personalised gifts, I think constantly trying to undercut other people 
just to get the sale price not game only doesn't not work. only de- well, not only devalues you and your totally. skill set it devalues the entire personalization industry totally. people think that that is a reasonable price to pay that a reasonable price to pay is one in which they just pay for the item that's being that it's a blank and the item and and the actual vinyl the material now yeah. no one else would do a job where their time and their skill is not paid for no one would do that in any industry so why should we allow that to happen in this industry and i think the problem is potentially people don't know how to price and that is totally. the greatest skill i think that i learned especially from being in sponsorship i'm selling tickets to a show which we know has the price an opera ticket but i'm selling an experience for you to put a logo on a page to put an ad in a program to put things that don't necessarily there is tangible and intangible things that i was selling so therefore i got really good at how to price an intangible and now increase it's much, the value and, and increase no, the value maybe not increase increase is not the right, right word but communicate the value communicate yes yeah communicate the value and one thing i did learn um, really early on in the sponsor, in kind of the sponsorship world is, you know, at Opera Australia, we had a bunch of kind of props that we had from all the shows we used to do. So if a sponsor is doing an event and they want to use those props, then sure, they can go to the props department and they can pay the cost for hire those props for their event. But if they're a sponsor of us, they would get access to that. Now that didn't need, that didn't cost us anything because the props are there from old shows. So we could decide to include that because they are a sponsor of a certain level um, and that then becomes a benefit that they have access to that and we forego a little bit of that profit by just selling it to the average person that has an event because you're a sponsor so it's all of that and that's what i i 100 employ that here the communication of of what you provide for free is just as important of what it costs. So when I do a proposal for a client in in any kind of creation, craft or food, I will say, this is my hourly rate for this work. And I charge more for photography and um, styling because I do that together. I charge more for the actual kind of the real learned that that's what they're paying for. They're paying for my skill as a stylist and a photographer. And then I charge less for cooking the dish you know um editing the photos all of that stuff is is not done it does not require the high end skill set that that the photography or the videography has so i charge those at different rates but what i also put in that proposal as well as my hourly rates is you know complimentary access to my prop store which is all my food props and everything complimentary lighting complimentary studio hire because they're all things that I pay for within my business. But by communicating that to a client, they understand, oh, by going with Amanda, I not only get her to do all the cooking, all the shooting, all that, all that, but actually she is providing those things complimentary. Added value. Mm, yeah. And yeah. the added value is what often will get the sale across the line um, more than anything because they go, oh, gosh, yeah, that actually is a reasonable price. Not just it's five thousand dollars for this shoot. It's it's this much per hour for this many hours for recipe development. It's this much an hour for this many hours. I break everything down. I give them so much detail that actually they properly value and understand my offering. And that one hundred percent is a learned skill from sponsorship background, because yeah. that's how you get them across yeah. the line. And I think that uh, a lot of businesses especially when they're starting they think it is a price game so then they feel like they have to match whatever it is right which is why um I encourage a lot of my community members to realize what that value is whether it's increase after sales support after sales support is a is a you know a term like a fancy term for basically being a nice person afterwards right yes <laughs> so <laughs> if you you know if there's a problem with the item you best know that I'm going to get you a replacement and, and that's, you know, and that's same as, for example, uh, uh, something that I do in my business is I go through my Australia post, um, my my business account. And if something is a bit funny, as in it's it should have been delivered last week, but it still says on the way or something happened and, you know, for some reason it hasn't delivered, I'm calling the customer. I call them or I text yes. them and I say, oh, I noticed this, like what's happened? And nine times out of 10, it's it's been delivered, like probably yes. weeks ago. But the customer 
re, like, appreciates, understands, appreciates yeah. that, right? And the yeah. same thing. If someone calls me and says, oh, I don't know how to adhere the vinyl on the thing, I have a reel. I send yeah. them a reel and I say, this is how you do it. If you have any questions, let me know. They yeah. know that I'm going to reply, which is really interesting because I found that as a gap. When I was um, yes. shopping for blanks, I'm, I don't know how to use, I, I didn't know how to use this machine. I didn't know how to use this blank. And I messaged them and no one replied. Yeah. Yeah. So they didn't, and I know, think, yeah. I think what's also really good is like, I've rung you so many times and gone, I'm doing a sheet for cricket. <laughs> You know, yeah. um, I, I need these blanks. I need them tomorrow. And you'll go, yep, no problems. And we'll send a courier and they'll come to you. And that, that ability, I know that if you've got something in stock, you'll help me get it. And you'll help me get it as quickly as I need it. And it's that, it's all of that side of business that I agree with you. I actually think is more important than the item itself because oh, that's okay. the reason they'll come back. The reason why clients come back to me is because they know when I say I'm going to deliver it this time, like I've never, ever in all of my time as a food photographer, I've never not delivered a shoot at the time I said I would deliver it. You under promise and you over deliver. So I will usually say, mm -hmm. I'll get that to you by, and in my head I'll go, mm, I'll probably get it by Friday. But actually, if I give myself the weekend as a buffer, then I know I'll definitely, definitely get it done. And I always deliver by the Friday. So then they go, oh, gosh, we've got these shots so much earlier. But you, ha you have to run a business like that because often what I've found is creative people that are truly creative that don't have that business background or haven't had the ability like I have to work on the business side, they, they don't understand the value. They think that their crea creativity is the most important thing. But actually, it is being ahead of trends. Being mm -hmm. truly creative is coming up with ideas other people don't have and continuing to do that. And then offering a service and a reliability that will keep them coming back. And mm -hmm. I have over the years been able to increase my rates very successfully year on year. I still give original clients, I don't increase them as much. Um, so I'll, I'll, they will be on different rates. So almost every single client I have is on a different rate. Um, it's started to standardize now just because almost everyone wants videography because that's where we're at. We're in a real based culture. Um, mm. So that is just more time consuming. So that's been a good way, actually, that kind of shift in the type of content I create has been a good way of bringing everyone up to par. But I still will do things for old clients for free without hesitation. Yeah. I will say to Karem Pastry, who really needs something, you know, I'll say, you know what, I'll just do that for you. Don't worry. Or oh, I didn't, you know, they made a mistake. They sent me the wrong thing. I'll go, that's okay. I'll shoot it again. Because even though that is um, my time as a, as, as a kind of a freelancer and a business owner that works by themselves, I make the decisions on on what I'm prepared to do and I want to be kind and I want people to keep coming back and it, it's funny because my husband is in a in a you know he's in, in an advertising agency they're in it's an agency based culture where every single second of their time is is costed cool. out and is charged back and we've talked a lot about how to scale my business up and I don't a I don't think I want to scale it up to the point where I have to act like an agency. Mm. I would rather the selling point of our team, Let's Make Stuff, which is my kind of food team, content creation team, is that we are providing that service for small to medium food businesses because that is where the market is and that is where the gap is. People doing that successfully at a price point that is reasonable for those family-run or individually couple-led businesses. So, you know, while I know how to price myself, um, it is a real skill in finding the balance between not overpricing yourself and not underpricing yourself. And that, again, just comes with time. Yeah, and I feel like the time factor, a lot of businesses, they're kind of like, they, there's other things going on, right? Like they probably are at home with the kids and they need to make some money somehow and cost of living increasing, all of that stuff. So it's obviously heaps easier just to price yourself under, Right. But what I teach a lot of my community is that you would much rather, would you rather the one hit wonder, the one customer that comes to you gets their item and goes or the repeat customer, right? Yes. You will make yep. more money by nurturing that journey, right? So if you price it with the long game in mind, 
you will reap those benefits more because you'll have re- repeat customers. And that's the entire reason why my business has grown. And I feel like yeah. that that um, mentality and that um, ha- ha- is reflected in your business as well, which, yeah, yeah. It's a, and, which is um, a different it's a different set of skills totally that we have yeah. and it's different things that we do and they're both ancillary to the actual making of the craft you know they're like an ancillary role totally. but I think you know that's why I think that's why you wanted to talk to me right because it's a way of finding um a, a space to work within an industry without doing the obvious and um and I think it's hard in an industry where Anyone can buy a cricket yeah. at a reasonable price point now. I mean, the cricket joy is, in my mind, the most incredible machine. Like I, rocket, if right? I can like, use mm. it, if I can use it, even though I don't have it plugged in most of the time, right? Because I've got a three and an explore, like I've got to make a three and an explore three on my bench permanently that are permanently plugged in and the mats are there. But often my desk is a mess, right? So I'm like in front of that. Because I'm cooking and shooting and everything. So I'm like, oh, I could clear that space or I could just put the joy on the table. And sometimes I'll design things just to fit the the joy, just so I don't have to, you know. So if you've got a joy and anyone can go out and buy a a joy at an insane price point and it does so much, then you are, as a person, as you know, if your business is personalizing items, you're competing with at a reasonable price, anyone can go and do that. And so that's where you have to think slightly differently. It has to be, I'll offer different things. You know, SVG, people that design great SVGs, that's a great business. You know, if you've got a design background. But again, you kind of need that learned skill. So maybe instead of going, I'm going to make, I'm just going to make things and sell them, maybe you're doing an illustrator course or you're learning, you know, you're doing a design course. or. But a lot of these um, where you kind of think differently, they do require a skill set and time but that doesn't mean that you can't be personalizing things and selling those and having a small business there and doing the craft while also skilling up in other areas if it interests you and that's the key mm, totally and I want to I want to touch on one of the points that you talked about was um social media content changing changing the game almost like real based content is is really fueling your business and content creation as a whole is really fueling your business right so the way that the algorithms are right now real based content or short bite size 1 minute type videos are what's changing the game right algorithm wise it's all of the all of the platforms are posting them they're promoting them what's your kind of tips on how to best use that for someone that doesn't really have your skill set in terms of the design eye, all of that stuff. How, yeah, teach us a wise one. <laughs> um, it's, it very much goes back to the more you do, the better you get. So I think um, for, so, for, so I, I kind of create content in two different ways. For Cricket Cult, which is like a, a, effectively a hobby page for me, I don't make my money on Cricket Cult. But I do that because I really, I have so many ideas of things I want to make, um, just hundreds and hundreds of ideas. I used to write them down in a notebook, but then I just would never refer to them because I have 10 more the next day. Yeah. So I've stopped doing that. I just go, what do I need to make? What season is it? What do I want to make? What's some ideas I had? And I'll just make it. So uh, that's, Cricket Cult is purely me sharing my um, ideas. Now, I... Um, have been asked many times why I don't monetize Cricket Cult in terms of I don't sell anything, I don't offer subscriptions, I don't, I'm not a blank supplier, I'm not personalizing items. Why do I do it? Well, I, I, and why don't I monetize it? Because I'm so busy monetizing the rest of my life that actually I think if I monetize it. that, it would be too much pressure, too much stress. Yeah. Already and you'll lose go, the creative, creative, exactly. That you get yeah, yeah, exactly. Filling the creative cup. Yeah. Too much pressure then to do regular content all the time. And I, I was just telling you before, you know, before we started chatting, I am almost 100% booked till the end of the year. I've never been in this position before. It is the beginning of April and I am having to really find out how I'm going to find space for any new clients that come to me because I just don't think I'm going to have it. So if I then had to put pressure on myself to maybe on the weekends and things like that, come into the studio and make things because I promised someone I would do them, 
or because I got to paid money to create something featuring someone's craft product. It's too, it's too much. And I can't, and I don't, I can't take on any more pressure. So I run Cricket Cult really lean and clean. I, I use my phone for everything. I um, also, it changed quite seriously. Um, I kind of got to the end of, of um, I think my first or second year of, I've only been running it for a couple of years, actually, maybe three. I think I got to the end of the first year of having run Cricket Cult and I just looked back. I was doing the top nine or, you know, when you do that on Instagram, you're like, what are the top nine posts? And I realised that like seven or eight of them were the very basic videos I created, which weren't particularly great. But I was like, oh, and I didn't want them to be. Because actually I love photography way more than I love videography. I really, that's actually what I prefer doing but you have to pivot and you have to respond to the market. And so even with food, everything is, is kind of moving to video. I still do stills for clients. I shoot eBooks and do things like that, recipes for their, for their channels, but I do it usually associated with the real now. So I'll, you know, if we're going to do an apple, apple pastry, then I'll make that, I'll create the real for them and I'll shoot the stills. So, um, but even though I don't, love that part of it I know that without that part of it I wouldn't be able to financially um be as successful so the reels are important and so pivoting pivoting to the reels happened at, um, at the exact same time both on Cricket Cult and with my food business because it became very very clear very very quickly that that is what where the traction is and that's where the organic growth happens so um, Cricket Cold is still done again, I, as I said, like on, on phone with a stand um, that I got from Amazon, which I think, you know, I've shared with you that a lot of people use. Um, and I luckily, because I work in food photography, I have a number of backgrounds. Like I've got, I don't know, I've got like a hundred different boards that have different styles of backgrounds. So mixing it up is really important. So even though I, um, with Cricket Cold, I kind of follow a formula and the reason I follow a formula with how I make something and how I shoot something is because it's the easiest way for me to do it with the least amount of time. Um, so not only do I shoot it on my phone, I do do it in my studio. I shoot it in natural light, which everyone, you know, if you're shooting videos at night under under your um, your lights, you know, just your normal kind of kitchen bench lights or whatever it is, it's not going to look, it's just not going to look great. That's not how light works. Photography and videography is the study of light. And it's how the light hits the lens and hits your item and you manipulate that light as a photographer or videographer to create a feeling. So if you are, and those lights also in your, in your ceiling, they're, they're just not, they flicker. And especially when you're doing videos, um, you, you, you actually just can't get a good feeling. So the main thing to do is, so I shoot, I shoot in natural light on a bench that's very close to a window um, that's kind of flooded with light. Um, I do it all on my phone. I shoot it all on my phone. And then I go home and I edit it all on my phone while I'm sitting in front of the TV. I do that purely for Cricket Cult. Um, so every single thing that you see on that account is 100% created, shot and edited on my iPhone. And I've got, I've just done it. For, I've done it so many times now that I've just gotten it down. It's, it's as quick as I can get it. I know where to make the cuts. I know how to make it snappy. I know, whereas at the beginning, that, you know, I probably lingered too much. It was, you know, I didn't need to see that element. So I've gotten very good now at editing, which is actually kind of the key to making a video great. How do you edit it? Um, and I've developed a style for Cricket Cult that I now actually bring into a lot of my food um, reels. I don't do top down for food. I find food is much better um, in that lifestyle sense when it's shot from three quarter angles or different angles and you're showing different things. So I don't kind of copy that part of the videos I create for Cricket Cult, but what I do copy is the way that I cut, the way that I edit. Um, and it was purely me pivoting and responding to what was working on that account, which is so videos. It's it's interesting. Like we have a saying in marketing and it's um, test and learn, right? So figure it out, like what, what works this time, doesn't work next time, look at your analytics, what worked, like, and, and it's it's a muscle, right? Like the creative yeah. muscle. It's just like you go to the gym to increase your muscle. You need to keep doing this creative stuff to know what yeah. works for you and your audience and your community. It's and a it's learned like, skill. Mm. It's a learned skill and you have to take the time to learn it. Mm. And I feel like a lot of um, a lot of my uh, listeners 
struggle with that because they're like, I need to do what everybody else is doing to go viral. I'm like, no. <laughs> going viral follow. going viral shouldn't be the key. That should not totally. be your goal. It's shocking. Ever, ever, it ever. And that's what they talk about in advertising. So it's, my husband will say, our clients always come and they go, oh, I want to go viral. And he's like, well, that's not the point of going viral. The point of going viral is it's the thing you least expect or, you know, it's an unexpected um, it's unexpectedly popular. So if you're not chasing the virality, what you're chasing instead is quality content, learning, getting better, making things snappy. Um, and look, that works for me. videos and that stuff works for me because I think I've got a certain level of quality into in, in what I produce that has, again, come over time. But when I started shooting videos for Cricket Cult, I wasn't really shooting videos. It's not like I've been doing that for years. I was very good at, at, at putting things in a lens and knowing how, how the camera was going to see it. But again, it's a learned response that takes time. I think while pivoting is key, it is also important to say you have to give something a go for a little while before you make a change. So if you do something and it's not working for one video, that doesn't mean that you change your entire approach for the next video. What you do is you tweak an element of it. So maybe you make something slightly different and you post it again. The thing with craft is, like, I now know what goes viral. I pretty much know when something's potentially going to go viral purely because I now know, after doing so many of those these videos, what people really want to see. And it's often... You know your audience. Least, I know my audience, yeah. And that mm. then resonates kind of, it resonates to the whole craft audience. And so if I haven't had a lot of, um, if I had in the past, and I'll talk, I want to talk a little bit about where I'm at now with Instagram because it's a discussion that needs to be had that no one's talking about. So I will get to that. But um, but you need to, yeah, you're the decision, you know, you need to make decisions based on what's working, what isn't working, and you, you, you never want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You always want to just tweak something, figure it out, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, if I if I go, oh, I haven't had a bit of traction in a while, I'll post a particular type of video of, you know, something that I know works. Like, oh, that always gets good traction. I'll post one of that so I can just, you know, get a bit more traction, which is how I got to 100K because um, I saw, obviously saw, the, saw that the videos were working, made a decision, I think it was like June, ju no, July, August, August last year, I was like, mm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to post every three days. So I kind of, until the end, and I said, I want to get to, my goal was to get to 100K by the end of the year, purely because I didn't know anyone really that had gotten there um, personally to have a conversation with. And I was like, you need a, I needed a goal, especially if I wasn't monetizing it. My goal wasn't making money. It was like, well, why would I, keep doing it so let's see if I can get to 100k by the end of the year and I realized I needed to find the sweet spot it had to be videos that was the only way I was going to get there and I needed to find the sweet spot between um, not posting too many videos so I think seven like posting every day for me I, I can't I can't physically do that I don't have enough time if I'm doing videos I, I, the sweet spot for me was every three days. So it wasn't like I did Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I literally just did every three days. And because in seven days in a week, it was never the same day, but I had to have a backlog of things. Mm. So I would then, I wasn't as busy as I am now. I definitely couldn't do it now. But basically I would go, all right, I've got a Friday free. So I'm going to make three or four things. And then that will get me through it. I already had two or three in the back end. I went away on holidays. That's kind of when I started. I'd had like, I had 20 20 posts in the back end before I went on holidays and I was like I'm going to keep posting through holidays and I basically I think I got to I wrote it all down because it was like it was like gamifying it I was like setting setting those like goals tick. that I wanted to <laughs> yeah. achieve yeah so um I'll just find it because I here we go so on I hit 50k on the 1st of September and then I basically every time I hit 10k I marked it so I hit 50k on the 1st of September 60k on the 12th of September so that was two weeks wow. 29 so 70k on the 29th of September 80k on the 13th of October 90k on the 25th of October and 100k on the 22nd of November now here's the conversation we need to have after I hit 100k you will see if you go and have a look at Instagram now I'm on 103,000 so I was growing at 10k every single like two weeks, twi twice a month, I would hit the next, the next ten thousand. The moment I hit a hundred thousand followers, the moment 
the algorithm completely changed for me because obviously there is a there's a hundred thousand like the, the instagram's algorithm is obviously once you hit 100k who you're pushed out to 100 percent changes because i think what they're trying to do is monetize they think well if you've got 100k you're making money now i'm not clearly i have not monetized it on purpose I'm not selling something. I'm not set up as an influencer. I hate the word influencer. I really do. Like, I hate it. That's why when you say to me, oh, but you are influential because when you post something, I sell things. And certainly Lindsay over at Lindsay Makes, you know, every time I use her style, her guides, she sells them. She so calls it the cricket cult effect. <laughs> yeah, she does. Yes. And she always goes, thanks, Amanda. And half the time I don't even realise. And so you know, if we're chatting and she's like, oh, it's been a bit quiet lately. I'll kind of, in my head, I'll go, okay, well, maybe I'll make something, you know, featuring her product to influence. But I, but in my mind, I just, I just don't, I'm not into the influence. It's not a direct sales. Like, it's like, you're using it almost like how a portfolio works or a resume works. Like you need I'm a it. content creator, yeah. not an influencer. To display, yeah. So in my yeah. mind, yeah. I am only a content creator. Yeah. And if I happen to influence through the content that I create, then, like saying true to your yes. aesthetic, yes. Yes, yeah. So um, so I hit 100K and everything changed. So my videos still get the same amount of views in that the ones that, you know, the, they, were, they were always, and you can easily see it if you go to Cricket Cult and then you click on the reels, it'll tell you, it'll, you'll see. So you won't necessarily see in the number of views um, where the change happened once I hit 100K, but what you, what you won't know is that in the back end, almost no one outside of my 100K followers gets pushed my content anymore at all. Like I'm talking, maybe I'll get 200 new followers a week. And if, and if you have that many followers, you naturally lose about 150 to 200 a week. That's pretty normal. So everything just leveled out to zero. So then I go, why would I bother? If I'm not making money know. from it and I'm not selling it, there is no way I am going to continue to post every three days. So Instagram has effectively lost me long-term as a regular content creator. I will still create content when I have the time because I love it and everyone engages with it and I love the ideas and I do that. But that goal of getting to 100K and setting, you know, deciding to post every three days, potentially if the algorithm was different and I had been treated differently by the algorithm, I know it's, you know, not... It's, it, it is what it is. It's not like anyone has a personal connection with Instagram. But it does make you go, hmm, what else? And what's next? Because I didn't know what my next goal would be once I got to 100K. Um, but now I know it is not to continue in that path because they've made it almost impossible for me. So then I go, all right, well, let, you know, maybe I'll go over to TikTok and I'll see what's going That's on. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or something else. But even TikTok, oh, I just don't have enough time. I don't have time. The beauty of TikTok is I have two years of content on content, content Cult that I can yeah. push over. I don't even have time to set it up. I almost should probably pay someone. You can automate give it. Give them all the videos. Yeah, I know, but I don't even have time to automate it. I'm just every You set it up. <laughs> so know, you could. I so there is, um, there is a system that I use called Repurpose, and that's what I use to distribute, right? So I don't have an affiliation with them. I pay my monthly subscription, whatever. But it's a workflow. So yeah. it works on distribution. So I write a code, write a code. I tell it to one, one when I post on this, go to these channels, right? You can do that. Yes. But I and think, I can push and this to is my theory. From other places, but yeah. Totally, yeah. I think my theory, um, and this is my social media nerd hat on, right? My theory is that Instagram wanted you to hit 100K. So yes. promoted. So it could um, use my audience. Content. Yeah. Then when you join the 100K club, they, again, thought you would make more money. So therefore you don't need the growth. So you've kind yes, of shot so they would, up like or they this want and me then, to pay. Yes, or they want yeah. me to pay to promote that to promote new audiences. And I get it. They want to make money too. Yeah. But but they don't actually know, you know, they don't actually know what everyone's create where everyone's creators' heads at. And I don't want to be an influencer and make money purely from that portfolio from from that. That cricket cult is a portfolio for me. And cricket cult really is just it has taught me, it has made me a better food videographer because of what I've learned. And so they're all, it's all skill accumulation for me. It's not, I, I love what I do and I love what I do and, and how I make that money. I don't want to change that. So I think the beauty of it is also when I was at Opera Australia, I loved what I did there. 
So that all just happened naturally. It was a big decision for me to leave there. I loved working in sponsorship. I loved going to the opera for three nights a week and, you know, spending time with sponsors and that, you know, they'd fulfilled that kind of social aspect of what I needed. Um, so at every point, I think I've made all the decisions to do all the things that make me happy. So then pivoting or changing on that is it's not because I'm trying to leave anywhere or I'm unhappy or I'm, I think if you um, just have a goal of, of being happy and that happiness and what makes you happy changes over time. You don't know what you don't know. So you don't necessarily know that content creation is going to make you the happiest until you are close to doing it or you'll have to make that decision. You don't know that you know running a blanks business is what you were always meant to do with your life until you get to that point. So, um, which is really yeah, interesting it's... because like, I, I always say, know your why, why yeah. are you doing this and stick to that? Why? Right. So be authentic about that, which is why, like, I mean, I'm sitting here with my mum bun and a t-shirt that probably has vomit on it. Right. You love <laughs> like, a mum bun. That's like my favorite thing about you. It's my, it's my, it's my get out of my way. <laughs> I need to do shit. Mom, <laughs> like mom's earrings. I have to put a pair of earrings on and then I feel like I'm okay. With yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. No, but that's what I mean, right? Being authentic to whatever it is that you want to do and your creativity. For you, it sounds yeah. to me that this recurring theme is following your creativity and being true to that and it's got you here, yeah. right? Yeah. So I feel like there's not enough of that. And a lot of people, they start their businesses because they, yes, of course, you need to make money, you need to make a living, et cetera, right? But yeah. if you stay true to your essence, your aesthetic, whatever it is that that um, is your why, it will take you places. It's interesting too because there are personality elements to running businesses. I am naturally an incredibly driven person. Working from home or working from the studio or working, yeah. I just, I want to work and I'm happy to work and yeah. I don't get distracted. And I don't, so that means that I actually don't have to set myself goals. I don't have, you know what I mean? Like I don't know in five years I want to be this. and I don't, I don't have any of that. But what I know is I'm not going to rest on my laurels. And that's just something I know about myself. So then other people go, okay, well, maybe I get distracted easily or maybe I find it hard to kind of focus. So I have to have that goal. Um, and neither of them are, are, are the right way for everyone. It's the right way for you. And for me, it's following my cre creativity, um, being able to pivot by not setting goals and not deciding how something has to be because I know that I will at least work hard enough to deliver everything I want to deliver. Does that make sense? So it's, yeah. So some totally. people have to set those goals. Some people have to go, you know, boss life. That's not, that is not me. You know, like girl boss, like boss, like, you know, women power. It's, it's just not who I am. And that's okay too. I'm not aspirational quotes, girl. You won't find, you know, you just won't. It's just, it's not for me. But that doesn't mean that it's not, they're not incredible tools to help people that need that to help them find their why or to help keep them motivated. I love that. Like to be true to you. Like I am, yeah. the, I am the mum bun, right? Yeah. <laughs> so why, where, when you know, when you see me do my hair or like get dressed up, something's wrong. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I do something like, oh, she's been somewhere fancy on Instagram. The amount oh, of messages so that I had, like I think I had flat instead one day and I was going to an event and I was working in an event. I don't know why I did apply, but I got a message and they're like, um, excuse me, where's your mom? <laughs> anyway. The best thing is everyone's got an opinion, man. Mm. And that's the problem about being on social media. Luckily, I don't show my face too often. I don't really want to. Um, I do sometimes because I feel like, oh, maybe I should do the face behind the name. But oh, yeah, it's not but for it's me. But it's your aesthetic. It's your thing. But yeah, people come just to like your I don't want to be... Mm. I never wanted to be a celebrity chef. I never wanted to have my face on things. I just like making stuff that people love. Um, but it, it is one of those things where, you know, you just get the most hilarious comments, especially when you have the number of followers that I have. You know, it's like everything, you don't know what people are going to pick up on. And there is a particular video, um, Sierra had a space party last year. And so I made a space T-shirt, which had like silver foil and then all the planets. And it was quite a detailed t-shirt that required a number of layers <laughs> they're doing kind of two of the top comments were why would you bother spending so much time doing it I'm not selling it I'm making the one yeah. t-shirt for my child and these people are coming at it from a different lens right so they're like why would you spend that time well, it takes too much time it's like yeah but I'm not making 50 of them I make one also 
there are no clouds in space. I mean, that was like, it was a, it was a spaceman sitting on a rocket, which let's be honest, doesn't happen in real life, it's sitting not. on a rocket with planets and clouds behind it. And the one thing every time it gets posted or reposted by anyone is there's no clouds in space. I'm like, it's a cartoon. <laughs> so you do like, I do. Just let me be creative. All right. <laughs> like, yeah. And I do have a bit of it. We've got to like, Lindsay's a part of it, but there's a bit of a craft gang of us. We chat, you know, a craft crew, not a gang. That's got such a negative connotation, yeah. <laughs> but like a craft crew who all come to craft for different things. We all do different things. Um, but we get on and so we chat, you know, on WhatsApp. We've got like a WhatsApp group. But, you know, everyone's always, we're always yeah, coming to me about like this. the clouds. There are no clouds in space. I'm like, it's a cartoon, you know, and it's, you need, you almost need that opportunity to vent to someone and go, oh, like, look at this stupid comment. Yeah, you know, because sometimes oh, you just can't okay. believe that people think it's their right to say that thing. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really, it doesn't really bother me whether people like things or not, because I'm not trying to make money from it. It doesn't matter because it's just what I like. And I know there's enough people out there that like the things that I like because I've grown in the way that I've grown. So, um, so, you know, you do kind of take everything with a grain of salt, but yeah, that, everyone has an opinion. You just, you just, it doesn't really matter what anyone's opinion is, but yours. I feel like there's there's so much information that you've given and I feel like everyone can learn so much from you. And I know you're not that inspo girl boss, you know, all of that, but you are and you are amazing. (laughs) So I feel like everyone, I do do laugh. I know you've been amazing and I feel like people will learn a lot from this. So uh, where can people find you? Well, I'm over on Instagram for the moment. Uh, (laughs) If you listen to the podcast over at Cricket Cult. So Cricket, the machine that everyone knows and loves and Cult because it feels like a cult sometimes. Um, And let's make stuff underscore AU on Instagram. I also have um, let's make stuff AU um, website, uh, which kind of just with food photography stuff, um, probably not so relevant. And that's it. I don't do much else. Oh, and I'm on TikTok with Cricket Cult uh, because I kind of have to be. And um, that's where where you can find me in a long-winded roundabout way, (laughs) which is how I like to converse. (laughs) Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Deb. Appreciate you. (laughs) Thank you.